It's raining. It's rain that we need. But if we had had our way, it would have come a lot earlier. The weather is there to remind you there's a lot in the world that you can't control. This is one of the things we have to accept as we try to control the world, that there's a lot that lies beyond our powers. The basic idea of self is the more you can control, the better. And so the idea is a build in frustration. As you keep running up against things you can't control. Left to its own devices, the idea of self would have no limitations at all. That's when it would really be happy. So there's a built in tension, there's a built in stress, a built in suffering, a limitation in the idea of self. For a lot of people, they just say, okay, we'll just accept the fact that there are limitations and work around them. Push as much as you can to see what you can control. And keep pushing, pushing, pushing. Other people say, well, identify yourself with the world at large, or the spirit behind the world at large. But that kind of self becomes meaningless. You're defining self in a way over which you have no control. And to deprive the sense of self from any sense of control makes it meaningless. So what do you do? The Buddha says there is a way to find happiness. Taking these tools that we have as our self, all the different aggregates, and fashioning them into a raft that will take us across. And once you get to the other side, you have to let go of the raft. So it's good to think of these things in stages. The first stage, of course, is to be very clear about the limitations of this sense of self you have, because it's very tenacious, this idea that if I lose control, what do I have? And the Buddha's not saying, stop trying to exert control. Just to be very realistic about the limitations of what you've got. He points to the five aggregates, starting with the body. What have you got with the body? You've got, as I say, a nest of diseases. One of the contemplations the Buddha has is the perception of drawbacks. We think of all the different diseases in the body, all the different diseases the body can have. And John Fun has an interesting interpretation of that. He says those parts of the body, those diseases are those parts of the body. The eye is a disease, the ear is a disease. There's the potential for disease there, simply that other parts of the body keep things in line, keep things in balance for a while, but they're always ready to go out of balance. I knew a dentist one time in Thailand who was telling me that he had noticed that when he removed teeth and he would put them in an antiseptic place, he'd come back in a couple of days and there were little worms eating away at the teeth. The worms couldn't have come from the, the environment. They had to be there in the teeth. The potential for the worm was there. And for me, thinking about the drawbacks of the body, that's one of the most effective contemplations. Think of all the little worms and other things inside the body that are not really the body, the different bacteria, the different worms. And if they weren't kept under control, they would start crawling around and growing and growing and growing. Think of a dead body of worms. Well, that's basically what you've got here. Even when the body's alive, it's, the potential is there. 
And this is the tool with which we're going to find happiness. So no wonder our happiness, our ordinary happiness, is limited. Some of the contemplations are feelings, perceptions, fabrications, consciousness. There's a lot about these things that you simply can't control. They come and they go. You can see them coming and you can see them going. And things like this, if they're based on impermanent causes, the results you're going to get will have to be impermanent, inconstant, unsatisfactory. Not totally unsatisfactory. If everything were unsatisfactory, then we'd have to give up. There is the path, and this is where the Buddhist genius comes in, realizing that we can use the processes of fabrication in the mind to take us to some place unfabricated. They don't cause the unfabricated, but they can deliver us there. And so we still use our sense of control as part of the path. Sometimes you hear, we'll just give up, accept things as they come and go without trying to do anything about them. But that's like saying, well, just don't try to exert any control of your body at all. Don't move it. Don't adjust it. Don't care for it. It's a huge waste. Because the body can be used even though the Buddha has us reflect on the unattractiveness of the body and on the drawbacks of having a body. He doesn't say to try to get rid of the body. He says simply be very clear about what it's good for and what it's not good for. It lends itself to a lot of lust. It lends itself to a lot of possessiveness, a lot of des unskillful desires. It's not good for that. What it's good for is as a tool to develop skillful qualities in the mind. As we practice generosity, as we practice virtue, as we meditate. So you're using this tool, you're using this raft. Very clear about the fact that the raft is something just slapped together. out of inconstant things. But if you steer it properly, it'll take you to where you want to go, across the stream. In particular, the steering is with the meditation. You get the mind and the concentration. And as the Buddha said, as you go from level to level in concentration, different levels of fabrication fall away. They fall still. The chatter in the mind you need to get yourself into right concentration. It can take you to a point where you don't need to chatter anymore. You can develop a perception of the breath energy in the body, where you realize the breath is not the air coming in and out through the nose. It's the energy flow there in the body. which, if it's full, doesn't need to depend on the in and out breath at all. If everything is full and connected inside, the in and out breath will naturally fall still. That's when you can see the levels of perception in the mind a lot more clearly. Allow those to fall still as well. So you're still exerting control. You're steering the raft. You're not simply letting it float downstream where it can run over a waterfall or crash in the rapids. You're steering it across. You start looking at this issue of control inside the fabrications inside a lot more clearly because they come more and more to the fore. And the Buddha has you look at this sense of control, this sense of self built around the control, 
as a series of actions. These two are perceptions. And it's good to see them that way. Because if you ask questions about what am I, who am I, who's exerting control in here, who's controlling what, you fall down a rabbit hole. But if you simply ask, what is the voice of control right now? What is it saying? And is listening to it skillful? If so, you follow it. If not, you learn to let it go. That's how you get around that conundrum. What's exerting control over what in this sense of self? You look instead at the how. Instead of thinking in terms of becoming with a being in a world of experience, you simply look at actions and their results. And if that voice inside that's trying to control things is leading to less stress, can you follow it? If it's leading to more stress, you drop it. That's steering the raft. And ultimately, you will get to the point where you have to let go of all attempts at control. Because after all, the unfabricated does not respond to control at all. And any attempts at control get in the way because they're fabrications. It's very counterintuitive. Which is why the Buddha has you reflect so much on the drawbacks of your tools. When you see that the idea of the self is constantly running into limitations, the quest to find happiness through control is constantly creating its own problems because the tools that are available and whatever it is inside, in terms of the feelings and perceptions and fabrications that try to exert control, inherently limited. You're more and more willing to give the Buddha's approach a, a try. So when he says to see the drawbacks of the body, do it in a way that allows you to see that this is for the sake of something better. As you look at the drawbacks of the different aggregates, it's for the sake of something better. The type of control that you exert as you follow the path is very precise. But it's different from all the other ways you could exert control. It's the only form of karma, the Buddha says, is neither dark nor bright. When he talks about the middle path, it's not just a middling way. It's very precise. And how it looks at the process of control, and how it leads you to a point where you do let go. And the letting go is not simply stewing in wherever you are. You're letting go at the threshold of something really big. Now you let go of other things along the way. But as John Munn said, you hold on to, to the very end, up to the very end. The idea that you don't want to come back and, and suffer again. And then any attempt to live in a world where you're trying to exert control over your environment and stay within that environment. will inherently involve suffering. There's one way out. The world is telling us in spades right now that it's not a really good place to try to stay. So you do good as part of the path. You leave behind some good.
but you're going to something better. Always keep that in mind. Sometimes the path seems long. But remember that the ways of the world that are off the path are a lot longer. And they involve a lot of suffering. Whereas the Buddhist path, even though there is some stress, there is some pain involved in the practice. It leads you to a happiness that more than compensates for whatever difficulties were involved in getting there. <laughs>